I'm just going to start recording now. And OK, so here we go. And uh, first of all, thank you all very much. There's a massive audience again tonight. I'm delighted to see you all. And thank you so much for coming along with to the second in our series of lectures uh, on the North, uh, the War of Independence in North Kerry. And I'm just going to give a brief introduction to our guest speaker tonight, Tom Dillon. And Tom is no stranger to a lot of you. But for those of you who are not familiar with Tom, just to say that he graduated from the University of Limerick with an MA in History of the Family in 2014. Between 2014 and 2018, he gave numerous lectures on the involvement of Kerry people in the First World War and wrote the hugely successful 1916 cent centenary supplement published by Kerry's Eye. Tom was historian in residence with Kerry Library in 2019 and undertook research as part of the Decade of Centen Centenaries program. And before I hand you over to Tom, Tom, I just would like to thank the Department of Tourism, Culture, Art, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media for their generous support for this series of lectures under the Decade of Centenaries program. So I'll hand it over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Cara, and welcome to everyone for attending to tonight's lecture. Cara, we might just check that the slideshow is working there, that people can see it. So, is that that's visible? You're muted now, Cara. Yes, I am muted. Yes, it's visible yeah. now, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're good to go, sir. So first of all, welcome to everyone for attending tonight's lecture. It's a huge pleasure to be back at the Kerry Writers Museum again to deliver another lecture. It's always a great honour to uh, to do something for our local our local museum and our and our local our local town. So tonight's lecture is about Pierce Mahoney of Kilmorna House and the Visitors Book. On the fourteenth of April, nineteen twenty one, members of the local IRA broke into Kilmorna House, the home of Sir Arthur Vickers, and set it ablaze. One of the most beautiful and historic country mansions in County Kerry went up in flames. Vickers's body was later found in the garden with a spy with a note on it labeling him a spy. Vickers was one of the most high profile casualties of the Irish War of Independence and his brutal killing sent shock waves across Ireland. For the best part of a century, this tragic episode of death and destruction were all that Kilmorna House was known for. However, the recent discovery of the Kilmorna House Visitors Book has shed new light on the history of the house and its place in Irish history. The book was in the possession of the descendants of Pierce Mahoney, who I'm delighted to say, some of whom are, are with us tonight, and you're very welcome. Uh, Pierce Mahoney was the half brother of Sir Arthur Vickers. And it, the, the Visitors Book came to light through the work of Tralee historian, Maurice O'Keefe of Irish Life and Lore. Last year, I researched the visitor's book for a number of articles in Kerry's Eye newspaper and the Old Kerry Journal. The visitor's book relates to the life and times of Pierce Mahoney. Pierce was considered one of the greatest Irishmen of his time. He was an Irish chieftain. He took, this, took the title The O'Mahony in 1912. He was an Irish nationalist MP. He was a renowned horticulturalist and agriculturalist, and he was also noted for his humanitarian work in Bulgaria. Some of the most famous names in Irish culture and politics were welcomed by him to Kilmorna House in the later years of the 19th century. During the period 1888 to 1899, he kept a visitor's book in which dozens of well-known celebrities <clears throat> and public figures left their signatures. With names like William Butler Yeats and Charles Stuart Parnell and Percy French, Maud gone, the book shows that Kilmorna could well be described as Kerry's answer to Downton Abbey. Kilmorna House was one of the grandest great houses in Kerry during the 19th and early 20th century, and it was situated four miles southeast of Lestole and six miles northwest of Abbey Field. In 1834, Kilmorna was purchased by the grandfather of Pierce the Chieftain. He was also called Pierce. He was a solicitor. He was a supporter of Daniel O'Connell, which meant he was kept busy. And also he was the, the member of parliament for Kinsale in 1837. He was a repeal MP and 
this was a campaign um, led by O'Connell to uh, repeal the Act of Union, which abolished the Irish Parliament in Dublin and had unified Ireland and Great Britain. And this is very important to note because the nationalist leanings in his politics were a later inference, were, were a trait that was, he also shared with his grandson, Pierce, the chieftain. Uh, this Pierce Mahoney was also an improving agriculturalist, and that was another trait that he shared with his grandson. So Pierce Mahoney of Kilmorna was born in June, in Dublin in June 19, 1850. He was born in Dublin in June 1850. He was the second son of Pierce Kenneth McMahoney and Jane Gunn Cunningham. He had one older brother who was 14 years older than him named George. And barely a month after Pierce was born, their father died. He, their mother later went on to marry six years later, Colonel William Henry Vickers. And it was through him that she had Sir Arthur Vickers and as a, a, a daughter, Edith, who later married a Polish count and she became known as Madame Dianis. Now, George, as the oldest son, inherited Kilmorna when his grandfather died in 1853. And the Mahoney estate at that time consisted of 1,100 acres around Kilmorna House. 1,370 acres in the adjoining townland of Carrawarrock, and also 3,900 acres in what is now the parish of Ballydunahoo. This included the townlands of Garriard, Coolard, and Coolbeha, where famously Lord Kitchener was born in June 1850. Now, at some point in the later 19th century, George Mahoney disposed of a large portion of the estate under the Land Acts. And by the early 20th century, there were just 600 acres of the, Kilmore, of the estate left around Kilmorna House and also 400 acres of bog in Dura. George moved to Leamington Spa in England, but he died at Kilmorna in 1912. He never married. So on his death, he left the estate to his half-sister, Madame Dianes. And it was she who gave permission to Sir Arthur Vickers to live at Kilmorna with his wife. And that's just significant later in the story of Kilmorna House, which I'll recount later. That was how Sir Arthur came to live at Kilmorna House. So this is just an example of the family tree. And you can see George Mahoney, Pierce, Sir Arthur Vickers. That's how the relation was through their mother. It's a map of Kilmorna House. And this is a photograph of it. Kilmorna was one of the largest great houses of the gentry in County Kerry. It was three stories high and contained 20 rooms, which incorporated the original house on the site, which was believed to have dated back to the 18th century. At that time in the 1700s, the house was known as Kilmany House. And at that time, it was the residence of the Gunn family. Later on then, by the start of the 19th century, the Raymond family lived there and the house was known as Riversdale. And that name was apt because the house looked down towards the river Feel. Um, and then when Pierce, when the Mahanis came to the property in the 1830s, it seems that the house at that time then was enlarged and remodeled. There was uh, the, an Elizabethan style of architecture adopted for the, the building of the house. And as you can see there, and you can see the tall chimney stacks, and these had twisted they had twisted um, designs on them and also decorative brickwork. There were also gables on the front of the house with stone finials on top. And there was also a stone tower with battlements. Inside in the house, the interior was decorated with oak panelling. There were suits of armour and there were all swords and weapons. Many paintings hung on the walls, including family portraits, while some of the items of silver kept in the house dated back to the reigns of King Charles II and George III. There was a library of valuable books and also a chapel filled with beautiful objects of art collected from across Europe. You could nearly describe the place as a museum, but the, the collection of artworks and uh, carvings and paintings in the house didn't impress one visitor because um, he, he wrote that it was a mixture of all things from all countries and from all dates. Kilmorna House, this is the view from 
the from Kilmorna, the site of the house, down towards the river field. And um, actually, I visited Kilmorna yesterday, and the landowner told us that the river was actually diverted from its original course by the Mahenies and um, so that the, the river would flow nearer the house. Um, the house itself was surrounded by beautiful gardens and it overlooked the river and there were terraces with granite steps and also tree lined walks leading down from the house to the river. So visitors to Kilmorna could enjoy the picturesque gardens and the river and they could also undertake some shooting and fishing in the 600 acres which surrounded the house. There were many different types of trees lead, uh, which grew in the avenues and in the parkland. There were two avenues to Kilmorna. One was where the, 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 the Mahanis and the Vickers would have traveled. And also there was another avenue for the servants. And there were also rhododendrons of many colors. Rhododendrons of course came from, um, from the Himalayas. And there were many other plants from all over the world and trees growing at Kilmorna, including monkey puzzle and macrocarpa. The estate had three entrance lodges and the main entrance bridge, which we see here, you can see the lodge on the other side of the main road. Um, and this is a view from inside the Kilmorna estate looking out towards the main road. This entrance bridge actually ran over the railway line, the railway line which went from Limerick to Tralee. And just one mile distant from Kilmorna House was Kilmorna Railway Station. And that's important because it was from the railway that the many dozens and dozens of visitors who left their signature in the visitors book at Kilmorna, that was where they alighted from the train from all parts of Ireland, Great Britain and the world. So Pierce Mahoney had a privileged upbringing. He was educated at Rugby College in England and also at Magdalen College in Oxford University. But he didn't finish his degree. He went to study instead at the Royal Agricultural College in Cirencester in England. He excelled in his studies there and he graduated in 1875 with top marks. This earned him the Haygarth Gold Medal at the university. It's a prestigious honor at the university. And on top of that, four years later, he was elected a member of the Royal Agricultural Society in England. Pierce commenced farming at his family's seat in North Kerry. He lived there with his, with his older brother, George, who George never married, as I said. And Pierce kept a herd of Kerry cattle, which became famous, and they became known as the Kilmorna Kerrys. Now there were many accolades at cattle shows all around Ireland, and they earned Pierce a reputation for his knowledge of agriculture and livestock all over Ireland and in Britain. Um, just a, a point in, in passing that in April 1885, the Prince of Wales, who later went on to become King Edward VII, and his wife, Princess Alexandra, they travelled through North Kerry on the railway line on a journey from Killarney to Limerick. And Pierce had all his Kerry cattle arranged in the fields at, out in Kilmorna with their decorations and ribbons so that the Prince, when he was passing on the train, could see them and the train slowed down especially so that he could get a proper view of Pierce's famous cattle, the Kilmorna Kerries, as he passed. And he also got to view them a second time because there were nine of the herd from Kilmorna were actually sent over to London for an Irish exhibition in October, 18, in August 1888. And they were also viewed that time by the Prince and Princess of Wales and by the, the former British Prime Minister, uh, William Gladstone and his wife. And actually Pierce actually gifted Gladstone's wife a heifer from the Kilmorna herd on that occasion. Uh, the reason I mention about the agriculture and Pierce's connection to it was because eventually it led to his career in politics. He worked with the Irish Land Commission for three years uh, all over Ireland during the early 1880s. And at that time he, was, he became convinced of Britain's failings towards the land question in Ireland. The huge problem was that most of the land of Ireland was owned by absentee landlords. And they had little or no interest in improving the productivity of the land. They lived, they rented the land out to tenants and they lived off the incomes from the rents. And the tenant farmers then found, were in the position that if they, they, they would have had to pay for improvements to the land out of their own pocket and they would receive no compensation to do that. And then often if they improved the land, 
they would improve the quality, the value would go up of the land and eventually their rent would go up as well. So this whole situation um, actually affected the whole prosperity of Ireland because agriculture was the main activity in the Irish economy at the time. Immigration, evictions, land agitation and crime were all linked to this issue. And also it fed the desire for Irish self-government in the form of home rule, which sought to which was sought by nationalists. They wanted to restore the Irish Parliament in Dublin and deal with Irish affairs in an Irish way. So because of his, his work with the Land Commission, Pierce Mahoney became, became an avid follower of Charles Stuart Parnell, the Irish nationalist leader at the time, and the head of the Irish Parliamentary Party in Westminster. In 1886, Pierce ran for election in North Meath, and he was elected as a member of parliament for that constituency. And that's significant because North Meath was the constituency which, which first um, elected Charles Stuart Parnell as a member of parliament. And that just shows the close links that existed between the two men. Mahoney and Parnell were close friends, were very close friends. And an example of this was when Pierce Mahoney made his maiden speech in the House of Commons in Westminster. It was just four days into the new parliamentary session in August 1886. And Pierce rose from the opposition benches and he spoke at length about Irish agriculture the failings of Britain's policies in Ireland. And he said, in reference to Parnell, that he considered it an honour and a very high honour to belong to the party which Parnell led. Now, Pierce was quite an active speaker in the House of Commons chamber, and over his six-year career as an MP, he made 251 contributions. Parnell was known as the uncrowned King of Ireland. And he was one of the most famous Irish, famous figures in Irish and British politics to stay at Kilmorna House. He stayed there on at least three occasions and on two occasions he left his signature in the visitor's book. It looks like from the evidence that's there that he actually used Kilmorna as a base to attend political meetings in the area because it's known that he, he attended home rule meetings in Newcastle West and County Limerick and at Listowel and also in Tralee. And Kilmorna was a base, as I said, for his, his outings. And Mahoney was one of his closest friends. And when, when news, when the scandal broke about Parnell's love affair with a married woman, it brought the wrath of the Roman Catholic Church down on their heads that turned against them. And, and it, it led to a split in the Irish Parliamentary Party. And Pierce Mahoney remained loyal to Parnell. He was one of the few MPs who stayed loyal to the Irish leader. Parnell made his first visit to Kilmorna in January 1891 when a crowd of 1,000 people welcomed him at Kilmorna railway station. The following year then, he came back to, or later that year, sorry, he came back in May 1891. And he was a, a guest at the Mahoney home after a meeting in Newcastle West. His visit in September though was significant, significant because it was one of his last meetings ever. Uh, this was on September 13th, 1891. On that occasion, Parnell addressed a huge Home Rule meeting in the Stowe Town Square. And seemingly, he came to Kilmorna and he travelled with Pierce Mahoney into the Stowe. And on the way, they were stopped by a huge crowd of people who actually took the horses out of the, out of the, the, uh, the away from the trap and they pulled the carriage the rest of the way into the Stowe. And uh, Parnell went to the Stall Arms Hotel where he met a number of, of dignitaries. But seemingly on his way to the square that day, they bumped into Lord Kitchener. And this is seemingly the only visit recorded between Parnell and Kitchener. As I said earlier, Kitchener was born on the Gunsborough estate the, at Coolbeha, which was part of the Mahoney estate. And Mahoney recognised Kitchener, so he introduced him to Parnell. And the town square in Lestole was thronged with people on that occasion. Parnell made the address. Sometimes it said he made the address from the windows of the Lestole Arms, but, but the newspapers of the time said that he addressed the crowd from a platform in the square. And seemingly the, the crowd which attended that day was scarcely ever attended 
was scarcely ever excelled in North Kerry. This is a picture of the square. There were pictures actually taken of the meeting that day, but we've not been I've not been able to uh, to track them down. And um, there were more, there were only cattle and, and farmers in the in the square that day, but the square that day was full with people. Um, the day Parnell gave one of his last speeches, and it's famous because during the course of his speech, he repeated the words of one of his most famous speeches. Uh, which she first made in Cork six years before. And Parnell said, we assert today in this town of Listowel that no man has the right to fix the boundary line of Ireland as a nation. No man has a right to limit the aspirations of our people. There's a story told that later that night when he went back to Kilmorna House, Mahoney was entertain or, um, Pierce Mahoney entertained Parnell to dinner. And Parnell was a very superstitious man. So when he noticed that there were 13 people sitting around the dinner table, he got very uncomfortable and he insisted that someone leave. So one of Mahoney's sons had to leave the dinner table and this distressed Parnell even more. So the boy was brought back and not alone was he brought back, but he got to sit on Parnell's knee and enjoyed listening to Parnell tell stories and uh, over the dinner table for the rest of the night. This was the signature he left in the, the visitor's book after the, his meeting in Lestol. Um, before he left Kilmorna on that occasion, Parnell planted a copper beech tree to mark his visit. And this tree still stands at Kilmorna to this day. We were out, when I was out there yesterday, that we were looking, we were examining the tree. And the gardener who lived at Kilmorna at that time, Michael Murphy, he was one of two generations to work at Kilmorna. He later recalled that there were only three people at the planting of this tree. Michael Murphy himself, Pierce Mahoney and Charles Stuart Parnell. And he, Murphy later recalled how when Parnell planted the tree afterwards, he stood back from it and he looked at it and he said, I hope we have home rule in Ireland before magpies can build on it. What the significance of magpies was, I don't know, but he got his wish because with the Government of Ireland Act 1920, that was introduced to Parliament as the fourth Home Rule Bill that came into effect. And with it, you had the partition of Ireland. So Parnell got his wish, but not in the way that he wanted it. And there's a bit of confusion about the tree because um, I've always known that it was a copper beech tree. And this is a, a photograph taken over 30 years ago by and I, I have to thank uh, Morris Mahoney for for uh, for allowing me to use this and it shows the copper beech tree and the folklore was always that it was a copper beech tree which Parnell planted at Kilmorna. There's also another tree out there, an oak tree, which he's also reputed to have planted. That tree is not there anymore. And there were stories told about that in relation to Sir Arthur Vickers. But this tree is still there, uh, the copper beech tree. There were many other famous Irish nationalists came to stay at Kilmore House and signed the visitor's book to mark their stay. John Redmond, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party during the First World War, under his leadership, the, the party was actually reunited. He stayed at Kilmore. Um, you also had Tim Healy, the first gov governor general of the Irish Free State. He was an Irish nationalist MP and he stayed at Kilmore. And also what's very unique about this book and one of the pieces of history that it uncovers, which is significant, is the number of Liberal Party MPs from Britain who visited Kilmorna and stayed with Pierce Mahoney. And that's important because the Liberal Party under Gladstone, they supported the, the idea of Irish Home Rule. And there was a loose alliance in the House of Commons between Parnell's Irish Parliamentary Party and the Liberals. And when the Home Rule Bill was introduced to Parliament in 1885, it actually led to a collapse of Gladstone's government and it split his party as well. But there were many MPs from the Liberal Party who came to Kilmorna, among them these men, Sir Alfred E. Pease and also Godfrey Bedson. He, was, he actually went on to become the first president of the National Institute for the Deaf in Britain. Uh, two more were Francis Schnadhorst. He was involved in the election victories for the Liberal Party. He was an organiser and also Wilfred Lawson. He was another Liberal MP. Um, Pierce's support for, Pierce Mahoney's support for Charles Stuart Parnell had a big influence on his political career because Parnell's reputation was damaged greatly 
thanks to the, or due to the, when news of his love affair with a married woman became public. He later married Catherine O'Shea. She became his wife. And that's why Mahoney said he didn't have a problem with it. But the scandal split the Irish party, as I mentioned earlier, into pro and anti Parnellite factions. And this split continued long after his, his death. So when the 1892 general election came, um, uh, Pierce, Pierce, uh, Pierce Mahoney ran for election, re-election in North Meath. And because he was a pro Parnellite candidate, he, the Roman Catholic clergy and the bishop spoke out against him that they warned voters from the pulpits not to vote for the, the pro Parnellite candidates. And Mahoney ended up being defeated in the election by Michael Davitt, the co-founder of the Land League. Now the result was appealed by Pierce Mahoney on the grounds of the influence exerted on voters by the Roman Catholic Church. But, and there was a re-election, but he still lost the, the, re, the, the by-election. So he lost his seat in Parliament. And this election, this 1892 election is significant because across Ireland, that happened to candidates across Ireland, the influence of the Roman Catholic Church on voters. And unionists noted this because it strengthened their resolve against Irish home rule and any measure of Irish self-government, because in their opinion, home rule meant Rome rule. Uh, Pierce, after losing his seat, he still continued to welcome many famous people to Kilmorna House. Among them was the future Nobel Prize winner and the icon of Irish literature, William Butler Yeats. He stayed at Kilmorna on two occasions on December 17th, 1893, and again in May, 1899. And again, this is one of the pieces of history revealed by this, the visitor's book, because no one knew that Yeats came to Kerry, let alone stayed in Kilmorna, until we found this in the, the visitor's book. This is why it's a very significant uh, source of history, and it's very significant um, and important historical document. There's, a, there's also something in the visitor's book that relates, as, relates to Yeats's love life. Um, Yeats, Maud Gone was the love of Yeats's life and he proposed to her three times and each time she turned him down. She eventually went on to marry a Major John McBride who was executed during or after the, the 1916 Rising. And Maud Gone stayed at Kilmorna as well on from April 15th to the 17th, 1893. But after Yeats proposed to her for the second time, just and she had turned him down. Just three months later, in May 1899, he came to Kilmorna, and with him was another woman who he was connected with, and this was the West End actress Florence Farr. There was there was ideas that, or there was a belief that the two of them had a love affair, but um, there was really no, there has been no um, evidence to support this, and possibly this is again why the visitor's book is significant because it actually shows the connection that these two people stay together at Kilmorna House. Um, Florence Farr was a women's rights activist and she was a suffragette. She advocated equal professional rights for women and Yeats was inspired by her striking beauty and beautiful voice. She was, um, she performed his poetry and she was also his stage manager and constant companion. So this is the, their signature in the Kilmorna House Visitors book. And what's interesting about that is it shows that it indicates, if you look at the ink, that it is possibly written by the same hand. So Florence Farr and W.B. Yeats. Other people that come to Kilmorna House were, were the famous Irish composer, William Percy French. He's famous for songs like Fill the Fluter's Ball and Are You Right There, Michael, Are You Right? And many other famous well-known Irish tunes, uh, Come Back, Paddy Riley. Um, you also had Sir Frederick W. Moore. He was the premier horticulturalist in Ireland at the time. He was also curator of the National Botanic Gardens in Dublin. And this man played rugby for Ireland and he was also president of the IRFU. And his, his visit is significant because Pierce was a famous horticulturalist, Pierce Mahoney. And one of the projects that he undertook at Kilmorna was he got workmen to dig a water course which diverted the, wa the waters of the river field. And this created a stream which ran at the bottom of the slope, which um, where the terraces were in front of Kilmorna House. And at one particular end of it as well, there was also a boating lake. But this stream created an island garden and it was, there were little wooden bridges across the stream 
to uh, to get to it. There was, and he had plants of all different types. And you can see there where these trees are growing. That's actually the, the where the site of the garden was and when we were there yesterday. So um, Frederick Moore is significant. And actually, when Pierce left, Pierce left Kilmorna in 1899 because he inherited his uh, the the Grange Con estate in Wicklow. Um, his uncle David died, and Pierce inherited the estate and also a fortune. And what's interesting is, from that point on, the visitors' book records the signatures of people who visited him in his other homes, and it follows on from it follows on with him and the people who visited him in his later life. And uh, he, some of the houses he lived in at that time were Mucklock and also Coolbell and Taggart. These were other houses on his Wicklow estate. And Frederick Moore's name actually continues to appear in the later years. And also what's significant as well is that there are names actually from the Listowel area in the later decades. Um, actually after Kilmore House was born, these names uh, appear. And among them, just to mention them, were Lily Dillon, who was the famous aviator. She came from the square in Listowel. And also you had the members of the, the Cray family who lived in the house in what is now the Kerry Writers Museum. Um, so at the at the turn of the at the early in the early years of the 20th century, Pierce Mahoney and his second wife, Alice, went to Bulgaria. And there the two of them founded St. Patrick's Orphanage in the Bulgarian capital, Sofia. They, with the help of local dignitaries, they set up the orphanage, and upwards of 30 children were homed and educated. They were moved by the plight of children left without their parents. Their parents had been killed in the Linden uprising in Macedonia. So Pierce and Alice were moved by this and they set up the orphanage and seemingly the fortune which um, Pierce inherited from his uncle was spent in educating and, and uh, these, the, these orphans and in running the orphanage in Bulgaria. And he spent a lot of time there. He lived quite a, quite a lot in Bulgaria. And the orphans called Pierce their father and they called Alice their mother. And she died in, in 1906 and her body was brought back to Ireland and buried in Ballynour churchyard near, near the Grange Con estate in Wicklow. And over her grave is a high cross brought from Bulgaria, which was sent with the blessing of the, with the permission of the, the Bulgarian government. And the orphans, some of the orphans actually took the surname Mahoney or O'Mahoney as, as it, both of them were, were, were used at different times by, by Pierce. And seemingly the surname Mahoney is still to be found in Bulgaria to this day. Some of the orphans were actually brought back to Ireland by Pierce and educated at Trinity College. Uh, they, some of them went on to have very successful careers in the church, in law, and also at doc as doctors. And some of them settled here in Ireland. Their descendants are still to be found in Wicklow. And also some of them returned home to Bulgaria. Seemingly one of them went back and he worked as a doctor and lived to the great age of 102. And possibly uh, it was because um, Pierce's work, his humanitarian work in the orphanage might well have been influenced by his own family background, his own experience in his own family because he had lost, his father had died with, within a few weeks of his own birth. And then he saw his half siblings, Sir Arthur Vickers and Edith, Madame de Anish, they lost their parents, they lost their mother died um, and their father died when they were quite young as well. And it would have been George and Pierce in Kilmorna who actually would have looked after them. Pierce converted to the Bulgarian Orthodox Church and to commemorate his beliefs, he commissioned a fresco in a monastery in central Bulgaria. And this fresco depicts two saints, two local saints, and also Ireland's patron saint who I've used here. This is actually the, um, the, the image of St. Patrick in St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in the Stowell. And I just thought it was apt to use here because the image of St. Patrick on, in the fresco in central Bulgaria, it is believed was modeled on Pierce Mahoney himself. And I just wanted to make the comparison here. The beard absolutely um, does a great likeness. Pierce was honoured by the King of Bulgaria, King Ferdinand I, for his humanitarian work. And he became loved by the Bulgarian people. Even in remote villages, the name of the Irishman who helped their country's orphans was well known. 
Pierce shared an interest in horticulture with the Bulgarian king and King Ferdinand supported plant hunting expeditions um, for Pierce in, in the wilds of Bulgaria. He loaned him the royal train and he also loaned him the royal gardener, uh, Mr. Keller. And many of the plants collect, collected by Pierce were sent back to Ireland and grown in his gardens here. Uh, when the First World War broke out in 1914, Pierce Mahoney was in Bulgaria and he came back with great difficulty. He urged Bulgaria to join the Allied cause. However, instead the country joined the war on the side of Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Then following the war's end, Pierce argued for Bulgaria to be excluded from the reparations imposed on the defeated nations. For his service to Bulgaria and his humanitarian work, King Ferdinand I awarded Pierce Mahoney the Order of Civil Merit, which is on the left here. Um, this was in January 1915. And then five years later, during the First World War, Pierce had, uh, had taken part in, he had, in, he had worked in, to encourage recruiting for the Irish regiments of the British Army during the First World War. And for that work, five years later in 1920, Britain's King George V awarded Pierce Mahoney a CBE for his work in that. And this, is, this meant Mahoney, Pierce Mahoney had a unique distinction of being honored by the kings of two different nations on opposite sides in the First World War. Um, Pierce eventually actually returned his CBE to, to Britain in protest at, at Britain's policy in Ireland during the War of Independence. And he also resigned his commission as a magistrate and as a deputy lieutenant. And now during the War of Independence, Kilmorna House was the home of Pierce's half brother, 57 year old Sir Arthur Vickers. Now Vickers's friendliness shown towards British troops and black and tans in the area made him a marked man and ultimately led to his death and the destruction of Kilmorna House. He had an illustrious career as the Ulster King of Arms. This was, he was appointed to that position when he was just 29 years old. And this position, this was one of the more, this was the these most senior authority on heraldry in Ireland. Heraldry at that time now was very important, particularly to the, the uh, upper classes of society because their whole identities as gentry and nobility was built around the fact that they had ancestors who were granted heraldic coats of arms. And also as Ulster King of Arms, there was, he, he played an important, this was an important ceremonial position in the British state administration in Dublin Castle. So state visits by monarchs and all this, these would have been, been organized by the Ulster King of Arms. And Vickers did that, did that work. He was also registrar to the most illustrious order of St. Patrick. This was Ireland's order of chivalry. Part of his duties in this role included the safekeeping of the Irish crown jewels. Now the crown jewels were, these were the regalia uh, you can see the star here and there was also a collar and a badge worn by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. He would have been the King's representative in Ireland. And these, these jewels were made up of priceless emeralds, diamonds and rubies. They were actually given by um, King William IV in 1834 from uh, jewellery by his, owned by his wife, uh, Queen Charlotte. And just days before the state visit of King Edward VII in 1907, it was discovered that these jewels were missing from the safe in Dublin Castle, where they were in the safekeeping of Sir Arthur Vickers. They were needed for an investiture of a new Knight of St. Patrick, and the, the jewels were missing. The investiture had to be cancelled, and the king was furious. It was a, there was a national scandal which, went, which made global headlines and Sir Arthur Vickers was made the scapegoat for their loss. His brother, Pierce Mahoney, actually worked to try and clear his name. Um, but unsuccessfully, he fell out with um, um, Sir Arthur Vickers, lost his position as the Ulster King of Arms, and he retired in disgrace to live at Kilmorna House. His, his brother, George, was alive that time. He left him live at Kilmorna. And later, when, when Kilmorna passed to their sister, Madame Diana's, she left Sir Arthur Vickers live at Kilmorna 
with his wife, Lady Vickers. Uh, his Lady Vickers was uh, Gertrude Wright from Kilmurray in Castle Island, and he married her in 1917. There's just a little story about her was that she kept Yorkshire Terriers, and there was a graveyard in the corner of the grounds in Kilmorna where they were buried, and they had lit there were little headstones to mark their graves. Seemingly the workmen had to dress in black when the dogs died as well, and they had to be very solemn. Now, local folklore in the Kilmorna area recalls that Sir Arthur Vickers was very well liked. He was known as a very kind man, and he gave presents to the local children and his workers at Christmas, and he threw parties for them. Um, it was also said that he drove to Lestole each week with food from the Kilmorna estate and gardens, which he distributed to needy families. Now, a year before Kilmorna was, was burned, the year before Kilmorna was burned in May 1920, Kilmorna, the house was visited by a band of armed men. And seemingly there was a rumour went out at that time that many other members of the gentry had given Sir Arthur Vickers their guns, and uh, which he was said to have locked in a strong room in Kilmorna. Now, this was only a rumour. So the, the, um, the men tried to convince Sir Arthur Vickers to open the strong room door, which he refused, and the men left. But they left with a warning that told him to leave the country. Because his friendliness, again, towards the Crown forces in the area were drawing a lot of suspicion on him. The following Christmas, Vickers seemingly gifted six turkeys to the Black and Tans who were stationed in the stall. And this seemingly was, was common knowledge in the area. And also he continued to entertain officers of the British Army at Kilmorna. So um, the 7th of April 1921, there was a party of British troops uh, returning to Lestole after spending a day fishing at Kilmorna. They didn't visit the house, but they went to fish in Kilmorna. And they were on their way back just beyond the gate of Kilmorna. There's a bend in the road. And they were ambushed there by the IRA. Uh, seemingly the ambush itself was laid by the IRA um, in haste. They just saw an opportunity to ambush the British soldiers and they did. And there was one IRA volunteer, Mick Gallivan. He was killed. He was shot by a Captain Watson of the Loyal uh, North Lancashire Regiment. Now, according to various sources, including the Bureau of Military History witness statements and also the inquest into the death of Sir Arthur Vickers in 1921, the local IRA were convinced that Vickers had relayed information to the military about the ambush. And uh, Vickers was already suspected of providing information about the movements of local IRA units. Seemingly the, the, the IRA flying column passed through the, uh, the Kilmorna area uh, because it, it between Doha and, and Nakanur. And According to the account of Paddy Joe McElligot, he was the commander of the IRA 6 Battalion, Kerry No. 1 Brigade. Um, this was taken down in 1955. That the decision to execute Sir Arthur Vickers was not sanctioned by Brigade or General IRA headquarters. It was taken by, according to his account himself, it was taken at battalion level. And he had received information that Vickers was a spy and Kilmorna was to be handed over to the military for their use and he resolved to prevent this happening. He ordered the Dua company of IRA volunteers to burn the house. And McElligot stated he planned to deal with Vickers by way of trial. This is all in his witness statement. So adding to that, you have James Costello. He was the captain of the Dua company. And again, in his witness statement, he reveals how he dumped paraffin and petrol near the house. And on the morning of the 14th of April, around 10 a.m., they went to the front door of Kilmorna and they found it bolted against them. So uh, they, they broke a window and one of the number climbed inside to open the door. Now, while some of them went to the strong room and they blew open the door, they were expecting to find guns and ammunition inside, but they found there was nothing. There were only dumbbells and, and uh, dummy guns is what, what is mentioned in the witness statement. And while this was going on, the rest of them, some, some more rounded up the servants they told the servants, according to the different sources, that no one was going to be harmed, that they were just come, they had just come to burn the house. Um, upstairs, Sir Arthur Vickers was actually in bed. 
and he was talking to his steward, George Cunningham, when Lady Vickers came into the room and told him that there were men in the house with guns. This is according to George Cunningham's evidence in the 1921 inquest into the death of Sir Arthur Vickers. And Michael Murphy, who was um, Sir Arthur Vickers's valet, he also gave evidence to the inquest and he said how, how um, Vickers asked him to try and save some of the family portraits and other items as well were thrown out the windows to try and save them from, from being burned. So the, the, um, the evidence, the, uh, there's the, ev the historical evidence in the inquest, the 1921 inquest, um, one of the witnesses was the steward, George Cunningham, and he stated how he heard one of the IRA volunteers ask who had gone down the terrorist steps. Now, and someone replied it was Serato. Serato had left the house by the front door and he'd gone down the gone out towards the terraces. And the IRA men immediately ran after Vickers with three or four others. This is according to Cunningham's um, account. Cunningham said, I heard Serato say a few words and immediately several shots rang out. Now the testimony, testimony of Sir Arthur Vickers' valet, Michael Murphy, he relates that both he and Vickers left the house at the same time. Sir Arthur went by the front terrace, Murphy went through the dining room uh, to the kitchen and out into the kitchen yard where he joined Sir Lady Vickers and um, the cook. And immediately he says, he heard shots. So as soon as the raiders left, he went in search of Vickers and found him lying on his back in the front terrace. There was a bullet wound to his head and also to his neck. And there was also a wound on his shoulder. Now, Father Anthony Gohan's book, this is a, an image of Kilmorna House then. The house then was, was burned and seemingly, and, and with it, all the beautiful antiques, the priceless um, artifacts, all, all um, were all burned. And Father Anthony Gohan's book, Lestol in its vicinity, names three men as the firing party who shot Sir Arthur Vickers. One of them was John Jack Sheehan of Kyle Bui Lestol, and he was later shot himself by the Black and Tans. He was trying to escape from the Tans across a bog when one of them, uh, the bog is in Kyle Bui. And if anyone, ever, if you ever travel that stretch of road, you'll see a white cross up on the, up on the, the bog where the place where he was shot. And one of the Black and Tans uh, shot him as he tried to escape uh, that day to, to get away from them. Now, one of the stories told about Kilmona House was that there were a number of piece, pieces of furniture and also um, other household effects looted from the house at that time. And there's a story told again in the stall in its vicinity um, about the parish priest, Father James Beasley. He was a, um, a well-known Sinn Féin supporter, but he, he totally disapproved of the looting of the, of the houses. And the story related in the book says that how years later he created a scene in a local parishioner's house at a station mass when he sat down at the table to eat breakfast and he realised that the cutlery and plate laid in front of him had come from Kilmona House. So the sister of, of, of Pierce Mahoney and Sir Arthur Vickers, Madame Dianis, she received £26,500 in compensation for the burning of Kilmorna House. Kilmorna was one of 76 great houses in Ireland burned to the ground or destroyed during the War of Independence, and many more met a similar fate during the subsequent civil war. While these actions and places were undertaken to prevent the houses falling into the hands of the military and being used by them, there was also, they were also undertaken on the premise that if a family was burned out, they might not return and perhaps the estate would be sold and divided up among locals. Now that's not to say there's speculation about that and whether it happened or not in Kilmona, I can't say. Um, but the ruins of Kilmona, Kilmona House remained for some years afterwards and people often came to visit them. So to prevent this, the landowner at the time, he was a Dr. Leahy, he eventually brought in a digger and he bulldozed what was left of the house. And the rubble was actually, we found out yesterday, the rubble was up from the house was actually moved down towards the riverbank because the river was actually cutting away a part of the land which bounded the river and it was used to prevent erosion at that particular spot. And also uh, taken down there were the terror, the granite steps, the terrace steps made of granite were also taken down to, um, to, to that corner of, of, the, of the land. Um, and he didn't want people visiting the site anymore. Um, but even the fact that Kilmorna House was, was gone, would no longer stood the ruins that were no longer there, it didn't deter certain visitors because 
Legend had it that Sir Arthur Vickers had buried the Irish crown jewels in secret at Kilmorna House. And seemingly people would come to the place still with metal detectors in search of the Irish crown jewels. And the story we heard was that locals would actually on purpose dig a hole and bury pieces of, of all beds and hinges on the site so that when the the um the budding um explorers would come with their metal detectors and the metal detector would go off and they dig down with great excitement all they'd pull up out of the, of the ground would be a rusty hinge or a piece of an old an old bed so to conclude pierce mahoney was deeply hurt by the burning of kilmorna and he never again returned to Kerry. He lived out his days in Wicklow, enjoying the life of an Irish chieftain. In 1912, when his older brother George died, he became the senior male in the senior male line of the O'Mahony family, who could, and they could trace their ancestry back to South Kerry in the seventh century. And so Pierce adopted the title of an Irish chieftain. He called himself the O'Mahony, and he changed his name by deed poll. Now he he remained, he was a member of the church, he had always been a member of the Church of Ireland and he had converted to um, Bulgarian Orthodox the faith and he continued to receive communion at his local Church of Ireland but when the rector asked him to choose between the two he converted to be a Roman Catholic but every Sunday he would march to church dressed like this in a kilt with his hat and carrying a staff just like an Irish chieftain he had an Irish wolfhound and he was accompanied by a pike band. He was succeeded at Grange Con by his son Dermot, who served as a Commonwealth TD and later Fine Gael TD in Dol Éireann. Pierce died in Wicklow on October 31st, 1930, and he is buried in Ballinor Churchyard. He is remembered in Ireland today through the Navin O'Mahony's GAA Club, which is named after him, and also in Bulgaria, as you can see on the map here, in the Bulgarian capital, Sofia where there was a street named after him, Ulitsa Pierce O'Mahony. Um, also in 2004, there was a street in the city named after him to commemorate, or a, a square, sorry, there was a square named after him, Plosted Pierce O'Mahony. This was named in 2004 to mark the centenary of the founding of St. Patrick's Orphanage. Pierce was one of the most distinguished Irishmen of his time, and his name is still well known in Bulgaria. This incredible man's links to North Kerry and his family estate at Kilmorna are recalled and strengthened in the Kilmorna House Visitors Book. Um, its pages recall the, the part he played in Irish politics as an Irish nationalist MP, and also the visits of so many famous Irish political and cultural figures, people like Yeats and Parnell, Maud Gaughan and Percy French. This book gives a whole new insight into the history of Kilmorna beyond its tragic destruction and also um, as a place where Sir Arthur Vickers was killed. The huge political issues of the 19th century, Irish agriculture, the land question and Irish home rule, these were all discussed and debated under its roof. The visitor's book also reveals how an Irish great house could provide an informal setting beyond the realms of Westminster, where all these issues could be debated and campaigned. These are all issues, remember, Irish self-government, home rule. This was all the stack of the road, which led to, to partition in Ireland and also Irish independence, the Irish Free State and the, um, the, the, the Republic of Ireland as it is today. This was, home rule was at the start of all that journey. Um, today, out in Kilmorna, nothing remains of the Grand Mansion, which was once Kerry's version of Downton Abbey. All that is to be seen is a a few bits of masonry does a part of the garden wall still there and also an underground well but the one living occupant which still survives is the copper beech tree planted by Charles Stuart Parnell. Uh, this tree is a relic of history and it's the only reminder of Kilmorna Great House and the many famous people who stayed there and left their names in the Kilmorna House Visitors Book. So thank you. Carrie, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Apologies. 
I thought I had unmuted myself here. Yeah, I'm at you. No, I was just saying, as always, Tom, a comprehensive look at, at, at a part of our history. Um, sorry, I was just stopping the live streaming there on YouTube and 